I'm Abby Sharp, and I'm a registered dietitian on a mission to dismantle diet culture. Yes, that insidious multi-billion dollar business keeping us on a never-ending hamster wheel of hating our bodies, fearing food, and spending our hard-earned money on a seemingly impossible mission to live our best, or more accurately, thinnest lives. On my new podcast, Bite Back with Abby Sharp, I'll be using my signature science and sass to debunk myths, call out the charlatans, and take down the endless barrage of BS bombarding us every day. Tune in each week as I'm joined by guests for expert interviews, engaging conversations, and science-backed information to help you leave diet culture behind for good. Listen on the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter. Podcasts that resonate. Today, November 3rd, marks one year since we ran this episode on The Big Story, which means it actually marks one year, uh, less a couple of days, from when the raccoons that we discuss in this episode broke into my green bin. And yes, it was one of those raccoon-proof green bins, And yes, I've since attached bungee cords to it in an effort to secure it further. And it's happened again, and uh, my neighbor has now resorted to just keeping a big old concrete slab on top of his green bin. And God bless him, that seems to do the trick. Anyway, yeah, we live in Toronto with the raccoons. Uh, Here's an episode about how they took over our city from us. Enjoy. Toronto, Ontario, is many things. The center of the universe. The most annoying city in Canada. A city that desperately wants to be New York or London, but never quite gets there. Let's be real, though. Mostly, Toronto is one gigantic raccoon den with a few million people who happen to live there, too. Toronto is now considered the raccoon capital of the world. Whether you like them or hate them. Annoyed. What do you do about it? Can't do a thing about it. So we got a call about raccoons being in a porch. Go. You guys are huge. (laughs) The raccoon is going for a swim in our pool. What? Is going on here. A family of raccoons broke into the ceiling of this RBC branch on August 23rd. And no, they're not there to make a deposit. The people of Toronto take over Twitter with an outpouring of love for a dead raccoon. I could have played you 20 more of those clips, and I'm not kidding. Toronto is the city that created raccoon proof garbage bins. And the raccoons then found a way into them. It is not a city at war with raccoons. It is a city that has already lost that war and has resigned itself to its fate. But it wasn't always this way. A century ago, raccoons were so rare in Toronto that people who encountered them didn't know what they were. Now, Torontonians wear raccoon-themed memorabilia and embrace the creature as the city's unofficial mascot. Because, hey, if you can't beat them, and listen, Toronto really cannot beat them, you might as well join them. So how did this city get here? And where, exactly, along the way, was this war actually lost? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Amy Dempsey is a senior writer with the Toronto Star who dug into the long uh, and curious history of raccoons in Toronto. Hello, Amy. Hello. Why don't you just start by telling us uh, the raccoon origin story in Toronto? You went a long way back and I guess dug this out of the archives? Yeah, so I have spent a couple of years digging into the archives at the Toronto Star to try and figure out when we started having raccoon problems. And I came across a story that made me laugh from 1925. It was prominently placed, large letters declaring wild game haunting environs of Rosedale. 
And then there's there's a number of headlines that come along with this old school news story. Prowling raccoon falls victim to gardener in exclusive district. Ransacked pale every night till beguiled by sardine tin. <laughs> so when I saw that, I thought, okay, wow, this was a big enough deal to make the news in 1925. And what I learned is uh, it was a big enough deal to make the news because we didn't really have many raccoons in the city at that time. And who among us has not been beguiled by a sardine tin? Uh, the, <laughs> those sardine tins. Very enticing. Listen, you took, as you mentioned, an incredible deep dive into the history and the archives of Toronto and raccoons. Let me just ask, like, why? Why did you want to do it? How did you do it? Well, it started when a few years ago, I became curious about Toronto's new green bins, the ones that were supposed to be raccoon resistant or raccoon proof. And when those green bins came out, the public was a little concerned that raccoons were going to be killed off, that there'd be no more raccoons left in the city. But I found um, at home that raccoons were getting into my green bin still. They were getting Uh into the raccoon-proof green bin. And so I set out to figure out exactly how they were doing this. And I spent a wild summer recording raccoons in my backyard using a trail camera to figure out how they were doing it and to prove to the city that they were doing it because the city at the time was saying, no, you probably just didn't lock the bin correctly. Right. They were blaming homeowners for these raccoon breaches. Anyhow, I, I, at that time, uh, while I was doing all that raccoon recording, I, I just started to think, how did we get here? How did we as a city uh, come to have such a strange relationship with raccoons, loving them on the one hand, hating them on the other, but how did they become, how did they come to play such a large role in our lives? And that's what prompted me to look into the history. When you look into that history, you know, we take for granted now that raccoons are kind of pests and they will break into your garbage and they will leave messes. They might even break into your house. We can discuss all of that. Have they always been viewed this way as this kind of wild pest from nature? Well, a hundred years ago, they weren't considered a pest because they were sort of considered a novelty. It was a spectacle to see a raccoon in Toronto when one did appear in the 1920s and the 1930s. You would see a couple of raccoons ending up trapped on a hydro pole. Or I found a story from 1935 where some boys called the fire department and police to rescue a cat from a tree, but the cat turned out to be a raccoon. And the police were so excited, they declared it the first raccoon in East York. Hmm. You know, it was like a treat to see a raccoon and a really exciting event. Of course, raccoons were here long before humans, but we built cities and pushed them out. At a certain point, though, what I found is raccoons looked into the city and wanted to come back. They liked what they saw here. How did it begin to go from the way you've just described it, like a curiosity and uh, something to point out to, um, hey, maybe these things are causing some problems in the city? Okay, so in the 1950s, we start to see a lot of news stories about raccoons. Raccoons have always made the news, okay? And I think that's because they're cute, they're curious, they get up to tricks, they like to vex humans. And so often they're making, you know, the front, the front page of, of newspapers. Uh, so in the 1950s, we see newspapers start to declare Toronto a raccoon town. <laughs> <laughs> things they start doing, they broke into, uh, a raccoon broke into a hen house and <laughs> murdered. Murdered. It's the, the word the newspaper used at the time. Murdered a dozen chickens or 16 chickens. And neighbors went chasing it through backyards and, and captured it, but did not kill it, captured it and gave it over to the Humane Society. Over time, though, raccoons are... The more they're seen and the more raccoons that come into the city, the closer they get to humans, the less they fear humans and the more comfortable they are coming onto our properties. And when they when they're not just a creature that is seen in parks or seen, you know, in a tree or on a hydro pole, but it's when they get closer to our properties that we begin to have problems. 
And this has kind of been referred to uh, by yourself and, and many others as like a long running war with the raccoons. And every notable war has famous skirmishes. So what happened at the Battle of the Row Houses? It seems like this was a turning point in Toronto's history with the raccoon. Yes. So in, in 1965, this ongoing incident in Little Italy on Clinton Street makes the news. There are 10 connected row houses on Clinton Street that share a 60 meter long attic. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those spaces where it's not a real attic. It's just a small kind of crawl space. Mm -hmm. So humans can't get in there, but raccoons had clawed their way in. And the residents of those homes uh, reported hearing noises that sounded like the Woodbine racetrack fights and wild skirmishes in the middle of the night. And because humans aren't really used to encountering raccoons at that time, this is kind of terrifying for these residents and really disruptive to their sleep, of course. And they're afraid that these raccoons are going to fall uh, through the ceiling into their homes. Prior to this time in Toronto's history, when a raccoon is found anywhere, the Humane Society would come out, capture that raccoon, and take it away. And that is how you, as a, as a homeowner, dealt with your raccoon problem. Hmm. Now, of course, we don't have that today. Nobody's going to come and take away our raccoons unless we pay them. <laughs> uh, but at this time in, in history, we start to see a shift. And the people from the Humane Society and all the authorities start to back away from having any involvement in raccoon problems. So these homeowners on Clinton Street feel helpless, and they are demanding the city do something about it. How does the city respond? I, I mean, the row house is a great example, but like, it's clear that there are increasing incursions going on. That's right. So in this case, because of, I think, the public pressure, the news story, whereas at first the Humane Society and the city had said, you know, there's nothing we can do. We can rent you traps for, you know, 10 bucks and you can try to get rid of them yourselves. But, you know, that's it. That's all we can offer you. But once this makes the news um, and a city councillor intervenes, the Humane Society sends an inspector, but this inspector is quite unsuccessful. He captures only one raccoon in two months, and the raccoons are just going into the attic, eating his bait of fish and chicken heads, um, but completely evading capture. So these are particularly smart raccoons. So this, this battle continues for something like 13 months. Now, I went back to Clinton Street and I couldn't find anyone who was around during the 1965 raccoon occupation to, um, you know, to tell me what the outcome was. But I spoke with one resident who's lived there for more than 40 years and she tells me they still have, they still have raccoons around. Not in her house, though. Céline Dion. My dream, to be international star. Could it happen again? Could Celine Dion happen again? I'm Thomas Leblanc, and Celine Understood is a four-part series from CBC Podcasts and CBC News, where I piece together the surprising circumstances that helped manufacture Celine Dion, the pop icon. Celine Understood, available wherever you get your podcasts. At what point do we know how many raccoons were in the city and how quickly the population was growing? I gather there have been like several efforts over many years to try to get a sense of just how many raccoons live in this city. It, it has often been said that you can't count raccoons. And that is not really true. It just takes a lot of resources, a lot of human power and a lot of money. And so we did count raccoons. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Ministry of Natural Resources did that, but that was for a very specific reason. And it was because coming from the United States on its way to Canada was a huge raccoon rabies outbreak that was costing the U.S. a ton of money because rabies is fatal. If you get rabies and you don't get treated, you're going to die. And rabies treatment is really expensive. So the, the U.S. was spending a ton of money on this. And Canada wanted to avoid a similar fate of having just a rampant rabies outbreak. Right. So we started a program to track the raccoon population and figure out how many raccoons there were, where they were living in the city and in the, you know, in the suburbs. All kinds of wild numbers, thousands and tens of thousands have been published 
in newspapers over the years, these are guesses. What one researcher found was there were seven to 20 raccoons per square kilometer on average in Toronto. But in some neighborhoods, and this is key, I think, as part of our history, in some neighborhoods, the numbers were way, way, way higher. So 100 uh, raccoons per square kilometer in some parts of Scarborough. Now, you can imagine how many raccoons that is, right? 100 per square kilometer would would be like 150 raccoons living in the annex wow. or 200 yeah. in Roncesvalles or 400 in Riverdale. It's, that would be a lot of raccoons. So you can see why these pockets of Toronto have an even more complicated ra- relationship with raccoons than some other parts. In terms of that complicated relationship, how many people over the history of this battle have proposed less than humane measures, let's say, or have proposed just, you know, getting rid of the raccoons and Those fights fascinate me because, like, they are a pest, but every time you try to talk about maybe eliminating them, you can't do that. There are many points in our history where raccoons have become a political issue. One uh, was in 1975 when a city councillor from the beach named Dorothy Thomas stepped in and said, hey, should the city of Toronto take over the the responsibility for managing the raccoon population. And she put forth a motion to council to see if this is something the city could do. And the price tag for that was going to be $52,000 plus, which was considered an enormous amount of money at the time. Hmm. (laughs) And that was just going to be the starting cost. So to be fair, it, it would have cost more. But what happened at the time was the Humane Society you know, didn't like this idea. Their view was, our job is to look after the welfare of animals. And there is no evidence that raccoons are not enjoying life in Toronto. In fact, they're thriving here. So it's not an animal welfare concern. (laughs) But leave the raccoons alone. Right. (laughs) They're doing great. Yeah. But then the following year in East York, things went a little differently when residents of East York were having raccoon issues. This was uh, before amalgamation. So East York was a borough and it had its own council. And that council voted to kill off raccoons and skunks that were captured in East York. Residents would trap them and they would be brought in to be humanely euthanized. That was the decision. And that prompted outrage. Just so many letters to the editor and some of them so, so amusing and so forceful and very little support. Huh. And that surprised me. Yeah, that's what I want to get at is like our relationship with these creatures in this city in which that we can be endlessly pissed off by the mischief they cause. But there is a line that we will not cross in terms of doing actually anything that might eradicate the problem. And it's such a, an interesting thing for a city to wrestle with. It is. And, and what I found, too, is it's particularly interesting because In the United States, in cities like Chicago and Washington, D.C., that also have a lot of raccoons, it is very common to kill, to humanely euthanize um, what they would consider to be nuisance raccoons. So raccoons that get into your attic or raccoons that are on your property and, and damaging your property. In Toronto, that almost never happens anymore. We have animal removal experts here who will evict humanely raccoons from your home, get them out, but not take them away and not kill them. And I I still don't know exactly why that is, but it's something about the people of Toronto that even though we have such a fraught relationship with raccoons, when it comes right down to it, we can't pull the trigger you mentioned at the beginning, I think, that, you know, it's almost become synonymous with the city. Like there's a, I'm sure you've seen all the merchandise, like the trash pandas have become kind of our mascot. You must remember the memorial for the dead raccoon. Oh, yes. Conrad. Conrad. Yes. That was his name. OK, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> but yes, he he sat there sadly for days, right? Yeah, poor Conrad. That was during a time of uh, low, low, a low staff time, I guess. <laughs> the city of Toronto didn't get out quickly enough to remove Conrad. And uh, so people created a memorial around his, around his corpse. 
when you look back at all the reporting you've done for this and you kind of look back through the ongoing skirmishes in the archive from the row houses to the proposals to get rid of them to the Humane Society being willing to step in, but not the city at various times. Is there a point where it just sort of becomes obvious that like the raccoons have won this battle and it's kind of like their city now? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me, the moment is after East York votes to destroy raccoons and the headlines say East York declares war on raccoons. It's the backlash to that and like the decisive backlash to it. I spoke to Alan Redway, a former mayor and council member in East York, and he originally voted for the killing of raccoons because so many residents had been complaining about, you know, raccoon issues and property damage. But when the result of this motion came out and the public reacted, he changed his mind and he ran for mayor that year on uh, a promise to keep the raccoons safe, to not kill them because the deluge of complaints that he got, nearly everybody, he said, was for saving the raccoons or preserving the raccoons. People just didn't want to kill them. So I think that's a huge turning point. And another one (laughs) might be the raccoon-proof green bins or supposedly raccoon-proof green bins. For me, that was a moment where I kind of said to myself, you know what, I guess if you're going to live in the city of Toronto, you are going to have to find a way to be at peace with the fact that you're going to have raccoon issues at your home. The last question I want to ask is a practical one after uh, all of this. Where does the city stand on raccoons now? What kind of resources are available for somebody who's listening to this and is like, you know what, this isn't funny. I have raccoons in my attic right now, or they live in a tree outside and they howl all night. Like, where have we landed with what someone right now in Toronto should do if they have a raccoon problem? Well, that's a very interesting question because the answer will disappoint people. And it is that it's on you, buddy. (laughs) Sorry to say, the city considers it a homeowner or property owner issue. It's up to us to deal with on our own. They provide some resources in terms of advice, like, for example, you know, not leaving food out, not leaving things on your property that would draw raccoons to your property, like fruit-bearing trees or garbage or refuse. But you know what? In Toronto, in a city like Toronto, you cannot control what your neighbors do. You know, we kept all that kind of stuff off our property, but the neighbors who live behind us let the raccoons live in their in their little garden box in the backyard and fed them. So so we had raccoons, you know, defecating on our tree for years. Oh, man. So in my personal view, after all this research I've done, I feel that the city should do more and there should be a resource for people who have issues that they can't solve on their own when it becomes a neighbor issue. We need a trash panda hotline. Yeah, I do. Like like 311, except just for raccoons. Well, ra- um, New York City has a rat czar. Right. And I kind of think that Toronto needs a raccoon czar. I would run for that position, Amy. <laughs> Me too. Thank you so much for this. As always, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Amy Dempsey, raccoon expert, senior writer at the Toronto Star. That was the big story for more, including previous conversations with Amy, one of which featured, yes, a raccoon. You can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find us anytime on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. If you're listening until the end of the show, that means you like this show. It means you may probably know about my new show made by the TBS team called In This Economy. It is a show that's like a version of the big story, but for your wallet to help you navigate these, oh yes, unprecedented times. Anyway, if you like the big story, I promise you will like In This Economy. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a money problem you'd like to share with us or with In This Economy, you can write to us via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, and you can call us and leave a message, 416-935-5935. Both The Big Story and In This Economy are available wherever you get your podcasts. 
Give them a listen. Give them a subscribe or a follow or a rating or a review or whatever your podcast app suggests you might want to do. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is also a producer. Sound design this week was handled by Ryan Clark, Christian Prohome, and Robin Edgar. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And I am your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll talk on Monday. Ah, small business owner. So you wish to be at one with your enterprise. First, you must attain inner peace of small business insurance. This is Zensurance. If you're self-employed, an entrepreneur, or a contractor, peace of mind is just a click away at Zensurance.com, Canada's leading source for small business insurance. It's quick, easy, and affordable. Get an instant price today at Zensurance.com. Céline Dion. My dream, to be international star. Could it happen again? Could Celine Dion happen again? I'm Thomas Leblanc, and Celine Understood is a four-part series from CBC Podcasts and CBC News, where I piece together the surprising circumstances that helped manufacture Celine Dion, the pop icon. Celine Understood, available wherever you get your podcasts.